you don't know Jesus, sinner, come home. Come you know home. Jesus. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. I think you would agree that in today's current climate, you obviously are reading and hearing about war between Russia and Ukraine. War is a, um, it is one of the great evils of humanity. Um, and as I said, it's not only about the horrible loss of life. Um, a lot of it's also because very, very rarely do you actually have truly at the core what you would call a righteous war. There's always going to be somebody or even something within a war that may actually have virtue. But rarely is it completely that. For our country, obviously, we have not so long ago the war against ISIS, the war against terror, the way of war against terrorist groups in Afghanistan, we waged war against a tyrant in Iraq. You may find it interesting that if you are a student of history, looking back at World War II, the War of Europe was actually, many will tell you and say, it was actually won on D-Day. But then Germany, and more importantly, Hitler, made the Allies fight for every hard mile to Berlin. But it's the fact that the Allies, once they had succeeded on D-Day and able to land and take that ground, most would say it was just a matter of time, not so much if, but when. War. In all of its ugliness, in all of its terror. So with that in mind, I want to say this. The reality is the church has been at war since the resurrection ascension of Jesus. It has not known a time of peace. And you're going to understand more by the time we're done that I'm not talking about persecution. I'm not talking about martyrdom. I am talking about one of the key primary elements of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, living in a sin-filled world, facing a very, very real enemy. But I also want you to keep this in mind. Just like World War II, while the church has been fighting a war, it is fighting a war that first and foremost is already won. But until Christ's return, we have to hold fast in victory. And Paul, here in Ephesians 6, tells us how to do that. So let's pray and we'll move in. Father God, I would pray that you would give us understanding I pray that you would give us a humility to recognize perhaps just how serious it really is of the war that we face on a daily basis. Father, I pray that we would understand just how awesome victory is and therefore the ground that we truly stand on. Help us to understand these things. And I pray, Father, that our daily lives might be changed by that. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 10 starts off by saying, quite simply, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his love. Now, Paul has actually prayed for this back in chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. In other words, as he says this to us, keep in mind, he's already brought up the theme once before. He's telling us that there's something important about this idea of being strong in the Lord. Now, understanding verse 10 repeats upon itself. Paul is therefore using this as a writing device. 
to help us understand its importance. We also need to understand, he says, notice he says, finally. And what this tells us is that he is revealing that he is basically landing the end of the letter. But before he does, there's something important he wants us to focus in on. And that section, basically, from verse 10 to verse 20, he's not done yet. So in other words, Paul doesn't want people to skim this part of the letter. He kind of like the end of my sermons. When I say a key word or the last filler on your sheet's done, and you know what I hear a lot of? Closing of the book. Okay, you know, we're just keeping it real. So Paul is saying, finally, he wants us to understand there's something still important here that he's sharing with us. So let's start this way. Paul wants the church to be strong, but actually a more accurate interpretation of the verse 10 would be, he wants the church to be strengthened. But he also wants us to understand it's not in our own might or ability. The reason is for this. Anything we might bring to the fight he's about to tell us about, we are severely lacking. He's already prayed for the church that it would be strengthened, that it would find its strength in Christ in chapter 3. And now he's telling the church, reminding the church, urging the church, be strengthened in the might of the Lord. Why? Because as we keep moving forward, we're going to realize that what we're up against is not something we can slay or win against on our own. It's also a reminder of the victory we already walk in. Because I can't be strengthened in someone, for example, just just think about it logically. Jesus has stood toe-to-toe with death. If he lost that fight... There's no strength to be had. How can we be strong in the one that has fought the fight and lost? So by saying it the way he is, he's not only telling us what we need, he's reminding us of the fact of what's already been accomplished. Now, let's be clear. What what does it mean to be strong? Strength is an attribute that describes one's ability to handle a physical or mental, even emotional, task or situation. But not only to be able to handle it, but to handle it with a certain degree of power to affect change or to endure it. That's what strength is. It's power that you would have that actually affects change or to give you the ability to stand up under it whatever it is. Therefore, as I already mentioned, Paul is telling us we do not have enough strength to handle the war he's about to describe for us. This very statement takes into account every truth Paul has taught and revealed in this letter. Christians are to be strong in the Lord, and as Joel just mentioned, This first and foremost starts with the fact of whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not. You can't be strengthened by something you don't have. And so this is a challenge. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, 4 and 5, it all comes together here. Christians are to be strong in the Lord, dependent on the Lord. Chapter 5, submissive to the Lord. I was thinking about it the other day. You you watch enough movies, you come across a variety of stories that include different things such as the Secret Service. And I've watched enough West Wing and seen enough presidential movies to know that the Secret Service cannot protect someone who constantly won't let them do their job. You can put a shield around them, but if they move out from under the shield, it doesn't help them any. say that to say this, if we don't submit to our weakness, to our powerlessness, we will never know the fullness of the help God actually wants us to experience and enjoy. In other words, one of the things that comes into this understanding of being strengthened is the very understanding that if I don't acknowledge my weakness, It's akin to me 
stepping out from under the very protection God provides. A mother hen's protection of her chick only works if the chick stays under the wing. And to finish the analogy, I don't know if chicks have a rebellious streak in them, but I know we do. And we tend to almost like the danger almost in some crazy way because we like to convince ourselves, I can take it. I can handle it. And part of that is an ignorance of understanding just how lacking we are in our own strength. It's also, however, a lacking of a degree of ignorance of really understanding what you're up against. Not only could we not save ourselves, not only can we, not, not one human being outside of Jesus himself can defeat death. Sin is a very powerful, powerful enemy. And those that serve sin with utter devotion, they are a powerful enemy as well. Brothers and sisters, I am just telling you, Paul wants the church to understand its need. There's no heroics in this. To step out from the shield, the grace, the protection, the strength of God is not heroic. It doesn't make a legend. That's where, if I were to tell you, and I, and I am as big of a fan of the mythology and legends that our modern day presents, I would tell you if there's one huge, huge negative to them, it's that it almost tells us and convinces us we can be like them. In other words, we can manage tragedy, terrors, wars. We can handle them. We can be heroic. In the story of the scripture, there is one, one hero. And it's Jesus. David wasn't a hero. David endured and accomplished all he did because his hero was with him. All the key figures of scripture are never, never meant to be exalted as potential heroes that we can emulate. They are all vessels of the miraculous, wondrous work of God. God's the hero of the story, not us. So Paul, he's not trying to be mean. He's not trying to demean anyone. He is trying to just call it as it is. If we're going to endure the war with victory that's already provided, every day we need to be strengthened in the Lord. And I would just say this, too many Christians give in to the temptation to approach their everyday normal in their own strength. And unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that become casualties of war, a war that unfortunately has already been won. We behave and function as if it's either A, not going on. We behave like a spiritual war is not happening, or we behave like we can handle it. In either case, Paul tells the church with other clarity, no, you can't. So verse 10, be strong in the Lord, be strengthened by the Lord in his might. Then verse 13, 11 and 13, Paul again stresses through repetition that the way we can live in the strength of his might is to put on the full armor of God so that we can withstand the schemes of the devil so that we can withstand the realities of evil. Now, Paul uses the phrase put on in a variety of places. He talks about putting on the new self, Ephesians and Colossians. He talks about putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans and Galatians. He talks about putting on divine attributes in Colossians. And then, of course, spiritual armor, not only here in Ephesians, but in Romans and 1 Thessalonians. 
here we would have a very detailed list that uses the picture of a Roman foot soldier's armor. Oh, wrong armor. Go ahead, Bill. There you go. Okay. Although I prefer the white, I'm just saying. Um, now, here's the thing. While not every item is listed, it is done in such a way as simply this. Paul just wants to communicate that this armor offers a comprehensive protection, as Mark would put it. So, you know, when we get through the list, and we're not doing that today, just in case you were wondering, we'll be dealing with the list of the armor starting next week. But... The list that he gives, the armor, and the way he helps us understand, he's using a picture of something they would have understood. And in Ephesus, they would have understood a Roman soldier very well. They would not have had to work hard to think about what that would have looked like. So the pieces that Paul uses, they, they, they grab a hold of very easily. And he's helping them understand the protection of this armor. This spiritual armor is complete. It's comprehensive. However, it's also important to make sure that the emphasis that Paul puts, it's on the armor of God. Once again, pointing us to who actually supplies the armor. And and therefore supporting the instruction of verse 10. Verse 11 and verse 13 tells us how we can be strengthened in the Lord's might. And the how is found in the armor of God. Now, here's something interesting that I hadn't thought of until my study this week. Please notice the objective for Paul. He doesn't say... Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to win. It doesn't say that. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to win. It doesn't say that. Instead, the objective Paul points to is something that is important to distinguish. You see, the battle, the war, has been won. Christ has already done the winning of the war. The objective of putting on the armor each day is so that we may stand firm against evil in all of its forms. Paul actually uses this idea of standing in verses 11, 13, and 14. He says it like four or five times. Stand, stand firm, withstand. He's wanting the church to understand what their objective is. It's not to win. That's already done. It's to stand in that victory. It is to enjoy that victory. It is to endure the ugly of evil until the final day. <clears throat> because we're still surrounded by it. And to be fair, we also are still carrying the potential to, quite frankly, express evil ourselves. So this protection is not only against any evil we might face within any given day from outside. It is actually the more we carry and wear the armor of God, we are going to produce less evil ourselves. We have to understand, please, he uses the word, what does he say? He talks about wrestling. He says in verse 12, for we do not wrestle. Well, first of all, just understand this. The context Paul is presenting, he is wanting us to understand, we're in serious daily battle. And this battle isn't fought by another army. And this, this battle isn't fought from sniping distance as much as we'd like to. The imagery he's using is an up and close, close quarters battle. And with this in mind, while verses 11 and 13 tell us to put on the armor so that we might stand, verse 12 then tells us in between what you're standing against. So, first and foremost, the battle, the war, 
each day we are not fighting, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. Matthew 16, 1 Corinthians 15, Hebrews 2, all of these helping us remember the fight is not against flesh and blood. In other words, our fight actually isn't with people. Hmm. Who would have thought that? We sure do spend a lot of time in our days fighting, getting really mad and angry, distressed, distraught, like that word, with people. And yet, Paul tells Christians, your fight isn't with people. Hmm. I would say that Christians are a little too easily fooled and misdirected. We put a little bit too much of our energy fighting with people, fighting fights that focus on people. So much of society is very scared, very angry, and because we can't actually slay the dragon of our fear or misguided hate or insecurities, because we can't actually slay the dragon that's causing our disruption inside, we tend to target, we tend to pour out that energy on people, usually the people around us. Sin is expressed by people, and people do unkind, mean, careless, cruel, harmful things to one another. Therefore, Paul and I are not saying that we completely ignore or avoid confrontation with people. However, Paul is urging the church to keep in mind, in our hearts, in our minds, who and what the real battle is against. just too easy to see a person who hurts me as my enemy. And I would tell you, I've had to work through this lesson the hard way a lot. Anytime I've ever given in to the temptation to see a person as my enemy, and let me just be really clear on this, anytime I have given in to the temptation to see a fellow believer as an enemy, I am completely ignoring and not remembering the rest of the Ephesian life. No matter how much sin we can and sometimes do express to each other, we are not each other's enemies. We unfortunately may very well be vessels of harm, sin, selfishness, pride, Careless things. But friends, I'm just telling you, we've got to let God help us stop giving into the temptation that our spouses, our neighbors, our fellow church friends are our enemies. enemy Paul describes is, is a full expression of evil. Our enemy is found, it says, in the rulers, authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now I'll say this. It is tempting to see these as four separate groups. I would tell you I understand. We want to sort of see evil in, in various categories of social disorder, social evils, various evil constructs found within society, and I understand that. I, I would agree with you that a great amount of evil is expressed in government, in uh, corporate sectors, in uh, the abuses of powers and authorities on the planet. I, I, there's no way to disagree with that. But I don't see that's what Paul's getting at. I actually would tell you, I think, that Merkel thinks it would be more accurate to understand that it's one group that expresses itself in four ways. And it's just simply this. It's pointing to very personal, demonic beings that are targeting Christians, that are targeting God. 
and those those dark forces, rulers, authorities, cosmic rulers, they're, they're, they're the same group. And they use any and all resources available to them. And you know what one of their favorite resources is? Some of the great things that God has given us. He love, the enemy loves using marriage against people. He loves using the family against people. The enemy loves using the church against people. The enemy loves taking some of the greatest gifts of God, twisting them and distorting them for evil. And the tragedy is that we let it. Because we do get caught up with people. We get emotional. We get reactive. And instead of slowing down and considering what the fight is really about, we react to each other. We react to society. And part of it is because people are usually the vessels. We, I get that. How do you distinguish between it? It's hard. It takes discernment. It takes slowing down to speak, slowing down to anger, and quick to listen. It's not easy to distinguish between the enemy and the supposed, what appears to be the enemy. It's really hard sometimes. And yet Paul is urging the church, don't lose sight of the real enemy. Selfishness, vileness, evil, in all of its expressions. And yes, many constructs within society that are used for evil. But yet, what are we really fighting? I think we would all understand that these powers will attack, do attack at different times, with different intensities, presenting evil days before us. And what Paul is saying is we must choose to make our stand with God's strength by using his armor which means we have to avoid the temptations to, quote-unquote, rationally ignore the spiritual forces of darkness. You've heard me say this before. You're driving along in your car. If you were doing this a thousand years ago, I know there weren't cars a thousand years ago, but bear with me. And all of a sudden it broke down. Your first thought is going to be, what evil spirit is attacking my car? Okay, so we understand. We're educated people now, right? We're modern people. We understand that if something breaks down in the car, it's because a piece in the motor broke. It's not an evil spirit. And yet, the various systems in place, maybe you're a student and you're trying to take a test and it breaks down on you. Is that evil in its practice? No, but how often can it be used that way? Because what the enemy likes to do is take the stuff of this world and whether or not they directly dismantle it or use it in the moment it breaks down, we're in the fight of our lives and that's what, where we drop the ball. I mean, how far do you want me to go into our personal everyday lives? The enemy sits, it says in scripture, like a prowling lion. And what that means is, let me just remind you of something, first and foremost. The enemy does not know your own mind. A lot of people have a misguided understanding of both angels and demons and Satan. Satan and Jesus are not on equal footing. I hope you really understand that. This is not like Hollywood, where the fight could go either way. This isn't about demons and angels as if demons have the upper hand. They've already lost, and they know it, and they're mad. They're scared. Do you remember how they reacted to Jesus? Whoa, whoa, what are you doing here, son of man? You're, you're early. It's not our time yet. Hey, 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 because they know. They know. Their day's coming. Just think about that. 
I'm pretty sure as insane as Hitler was, he knew the end was there. What does he do? He does what a lot of people do when they're put in a corner. He got desperate, he got stupid, and a lot of people died needlessly. Well, guess what? Satan's no better, and the demonic world is no better, and the cosmic powers are no different, and the evil authorities and rulers are no different, and they're coming for us. And they're hoping to sift, destroy, ruin, disenfranchise, whatever they can do. Guess what? Your pastor makes tons of mistakes, and I, there are days and weeks I'm a terrible shepherd. Is that reason enough to hate me, call me an enemy, or leave this church? Not according to Ephesians, it's not. The scripture tells you how you're supposed to handle your brothers and sisters when you're in this regard. Walking away isn't one of them. My point is, is it's so easy to get focused on people and what they do that we don't even slow down in our prayers and in our study and really think about how is evil prowling and waiting for me in the long grass. And so that thing I wanted to get done today and it doesn't happen, he's waiting in the long grass and waiting to see if he can hit me with something. Because while the enemy doesn't know my mind, he can learn my habit. And if I'm not standing firm in God's strength and the armor of, that he provides, I, it's like I said, if I step away from the shield, it doesn't offer me any protection. And that's our biggest mistake. We step away from the protection God offers. And we leave ourselves open to the enemy to hit us and hit us and hit us. And then it's like crawling back to the protection of God, hoping it's still there. And it is, don't get me wrong. God doesn't leave us behind, and he actually still protects us, especially our planks, a lot more than we realize. But the point is, Paul says, stand firm. He's telling you, look your enemy in the eye and push. So these powers are going to attack with different intensities and a different focus. And I, I would just urge you, be cautious against snickering against this vile, unseeable enemy. Because it's just too easy to laugh it off. It's too easy to just wave a hand and say, it's not real. I'm a modern thinker. I'm a rational thinker. It's just bad luck. See, here's the funny part. We'd rather think it's bad luck than understand that the Bible tells you, no, it's an enemy that's targeting you. If we snicker at Satan and all these evil authorities and powers, we do so at our own peril. Satan is real and he is vicious. Friends, the gospel has accomplished its purpose. 1 John 3, 8 tells us that in other scriptures. So I'm telling you, you don't have to fear as if all is lost or the battle is between equal powers. Instead, we simply have to approach each day with the gospel as our armor, because that's the essence of it, to keep perspective on truth, righteousness, goodness. Because the enemy just simply wants to use anything and everything that is good for evil to draw us and sift us away from each other in our faith. I will end with this. The enemy's favorite weapon, quite frankly, is doubt and deceit. Especially concerning God's word and his truth. He loves distorting it. And his favorite tool is to take slivers of right, slivers of truth, and use them in a very distorted way. For example, well, you know, Nate did call you that name that one time. And I think he meant it. See, the truth is, is that he actually did call me that name. And it wasn't very nice. But what may not be true is all the context around the why, what was happening in his life. Maybe something that I did that was misunderstood. We jumped at the sliver of truth, instead of slowing down and asking God to help us see clearly. 
Friends, I am just telling you, your enemy loves to grab you at this very moment. And if we're not standing in the strength of God, we are behind. The essence of evil and the list that Paul tells us, it centers on deceit and doubt. They use God's word, they use God's creation, and they use it in such a way that actually encourages us to deny his glory, deny his authority, and deny his holiness. Next week, we will start looking at the armor itself, as I mentioned, and how Paul helps us understand how to use it. But for now, let me just make it clear that the core of the armor is, in fact, the gospel itself. In other words, the work, the power, the Heavenly Father, Son, and Spirit that empower it, the gospel is the essence of <laughs> all the pieces of the armor. It's just a word picture Paul is going to use to help us understand different ways to utilize the gospel. We fight for every mile on the road to eternity, and we live hoping and waiting to be in the presence of God and his glory. But until then, we fight for every inch. We fight to stand firm where God has placed us. And we stand firm with a confidence that we're standing in victory. That's what Paul wants. We also have a bad habit of helping the enemy far too often by not taking seriously Paul's call to put the gospel on daily. So that we can stand firm in victory, holding ground, and even taking new ground as the Spirit enables in the souls of those who are lost. I'll tell you right now, the lost world needs to see more believers standing firm and actually taking steps forward, pushing the enemy back. My family crest just so happens to be, if you see it, it's, it's a faster around a cattle, or in this case, a, a large-headed bull. And the family crest is... It says, hold fast. And I've grown up with that model in the back of my mind since, ever since I saw it at my grandparents' house one day. And I'm not trying to tell you that all the clouds were believers. There's no chance of that. They're Scots. I mean, really. Um, but with that being said, for our family, hold fast was more than just a, a clan crest. It's something we have believed in, and it's holding fast to our faith, holding fast to the hope of the gospel, but also, therefore, a humble submissiveness to his strength, because we can't hold fast without it. By myself, I don't have the strength to stand firm. I just don't. So I would just say this, please give thanks for the strength that he freely gives and ask for more of it every day so that we all can hold fast in his victory. Because Paul wants to see the church standing when Christ comes back, not running away. But we can only do that if we truly put ourselves under his mark. We just don't have it. But we do have the victory. The way he begins, the way we stand. Father, I just pray for everyone here. Encourage them. May we truly be humbled by the need that we all carry your strength to look at the everyday things that would easily distract, discourage, that your spirit would give us discernment to see more than just slivers of truth, but the whole picture. And that we would really come to understand that our, our, our truest enemy is not people, but evil. 
And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us discern how to maybe face people and engage people and, and, and deal with con conflicts and weaknesses. That we would do that with your grace and love because we understand that the battle is against the reality of evil, a, a reality we all carry ourselves. May we be strengthened by your love. And I pray this in your